got your Bible tonight, James chapter 1, if you'll grab it, we'll look that direction, James chapter 1 tonight, James chapter number 1. Church, I mean, interesting uh, about the book of James, there's so many different things. I, I think sometimes we think about chapter 3, about the tongue, but James chapter 1, 2, and 3, you, you find there, there really is a pattern here. James is talking to believers, he says beloved brethren several times, and of course, uh, James is talking to those who are Christians. We know that from the very first verse, he's talking to Jews that were saved. It says, James, verse 1, 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now, I don't know if they were scattered abroad because of persecution. It's mentioned in Acts 8. I don't know if he's referring to they were scattered abroad because of the captivity, and they were scattered abroad. But in James 1, verse number 1, we do know that he's talking to those that are believers. We also know uh, from your Bible, and again, I'll just, uh, you probably, some of you probably already know, but if you don't, verses 1 through 12 is talking about testing. And uh, if you look at verse number 2, it says, My brother encountered all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That temptation there is talking about testing and how God tests us in our life. Verse number 12, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. What's the crown of life for? The crown of life are for, is for those who endure trials. And so verse 1 through 12 is talking about testing. When you get to verse number 13, the same English word is used, but for te it's called temptation. But it's not testing, it's temptation. We know that because what's said, verse 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So we understand that he's talking about temptation in verse number 13 down through verse number 21. Now, church, I, mean, I say all that before we pray tonight because uh, James is about to lead into something else in verse number 22 about being a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. But the reason he makes that statement is, is because of temptation, the temptations that we deal with in our life, all right? So we're going to pray, and then uh, we'll run. I'm going to do my best to be short tonight. I keep saying that, but I, I just, I, I'm not good at it anymore. You know, when I come here, I preach longer here than I do other places. I don't know why. It's probably because you can't hear me anyway. That's why you're so attentive, amen? So let's pray. Father in heaven, would you again bless the service, bless the preaching of your word. Lord, thank you again for... Brothers and sisters in Christ that we can be with, I thank you that one day we'll be with you forever. Lord, would you please again help the thought tonight to come across very clear, speak to our hearts, give us liberty and power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church family, I want you to think now, again, I just need to lay just a couple more statements of groundwork, and then I think you'll understand where we're going tonight. In verse number 22, it says this, it says, but be doers of the word. Why did he make that statement? The statement is because the previous verses is talking about the word. If you look at verse number 21, it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted, what's the word? <laughs> what's the word? <laughs> word, all right? The word is word, the engrafted word. So it's talking about the word of God. Now, again, I guess I just want you to understand what he's talking about here, is he's talking about, okay, you're going to deal with temptation in your life. So he gives, actually he gives five things a person should do in order to combat the temptations that we deal with in our life, all right? Uh, be swift to hear, slow to speak, uh, slow to wrath. And then he says, lay apart all filthiness. And then the last one is in that verse where it says, and receive with meekness the engrafted word. So there's five things that we can do to try to overcome the temptation in our life. Now, that's another message, but he's leading in to the thought that we want to look at tonight. Why does he say in verse number 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only? Because it's the word that helps us overcome temptation in our life. Just, I mean, all of us have things in our life that we know that we shouldn't do, all right? The Bible talks about three types of sins, the sins of error, which is sins of ignorance. Uh, the Bible talks about sins, secret sins, things that we do that nobody else knows about, we know they're wrong. It talks about presumptuous sins, sins that we do, I don't care if anybody knows about it, it's proud, it's arrogant, I'm going to do it anyway. But when, when we want to get victory over those sins... We're, we have to say no to temptation in our life. The, and what, is the, what does the devil do? He draws toward the lust of our flesh. What is the lust? It's that, that longing that we have for that which is forbidden. In other words, I know I shouldn't do that, but I want to do it. Paul talked about it in Romans chapter 7. The things I do, I shouldn't do. The things I shouldn't do, I do. It's because there's a war going on inside. It's the flesh and the spirit. Now, tonight, I want to talk to you about... Now, here's, what he's going, here's where he's going in James... He says, okay, I just told you how to overcome temptation of five things. The fifth one was, receive with meekness the engrafted word. Then he says, in verse number 22, that we're supposed to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter if you're Baptist. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian and you belong to some other type of church. 
The problem with us as Christians is not that we don't know what to do. It's that we're not willing to do with what we know what to do. All right? And so here James is talking to these believers and saying, hey, listen, if you would just do what you know. All right? Just remember, how many times does a person come to church and they hear that the pastor's not coming up with anything new? Are you all with me tonight? Could you say amen? amen? All right. Some of you don't move. We're about to call an ambulance. I think you're dead. All righty. Do you understand that when we come to church, it's not like, okay, the pastor's going to expound something you've never heard before because we have the Bible. We have all the revelation of Scripture that we're going to have. I get to read it on a regular basis in my devotions just like you. The pastor's going to come and he's going to preach on what God lays upon his heart. But we understand that it's not a matter of finding out something new that I need to do. It's a matter of knowing something old, but doing it. So here James is saying, now listen, you don't want to be just a hearer of the word. You want to be a doer of the word. All right? Now let's, let's look at these verses together with that in mind. And let's see what James says. There's three thoughts tonight I want you to see. Look at me in verse number 22, okay? You ready? Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, there's three things I want you to see about being a hearer, a doer, or being either one, but being a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word. All right, so here's the first thing I want you to notice. Look at verse 22 again. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. I want you to say, read out loud now the last phrase of verse number 22 together. Deceiving your own selves. Just I want to tell you something. When you have somebody who comes and just hears the word of God, but they don't put it into practice, they have convinced themselves that what they're doing is right when it's really wrong. They have deceived themselves. I want to tell you something. There's Christians all over that think they know more than the preacher does, and I want to tell you why they think they know more than the preacher does. It's not because they know more. It's because they're not doers. I want to tell you something. It's amazing how people know how to tell people about Jesus Christ who don't tell people about Jesus Christ. It's amazing how many people know what a real devotional life is when they don't even open up the book on a regular basis. It's amazing how people can come to a church like this and the pastor preach from the pulpit and they know exactly what's wrong with the preacher. You know, you know the preacher's just not as educated. Or, you know, the preacher just doesn't have, he needs a little more self-control in this area. Or the preacher, he just, you know, he just preaches a little bit too long. What, what do we call a person who watches a football game who does never played the game but knows exactly what needs to happen on the television screen? It's an arm, it's armchair or armchair quarterback. Now, can I tell you something? We got a bunch of armchair Christians. And they have deceived themselves to think they know. I want to tell you something, church family, this t- tonight, this is not a matter of scolding. This is a matter of thinking this thing through. The reason we are oblivious to what we're supposed to do in the Christian life is because we've heard, we've heard, we've heard, we've heard, we've heard, we've heard, but we don't do. And so what's happened is we've deceived ourselves to think I'm a good Christian because I came and showed up for church. You are not a good Christian just because you showed up for church. You are a good Christian because you do what you hear. There are people deceived all over. And I'm talking about people that are born again, people that are saved, people that are going to go to heaven. But they're going to go to heaven, just like the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, that when they stand at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bible says that their works are going to be tried by fire. I believe that fire is the eyes of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that their works are going to be tried by fire. And there's going to be some that's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. There's going to be some that's going to be gold, silver, and precious stones. What's the difference? The difference is a person who hears and a person who hears and does. That's the bottom line. I'm studying the book of Revelation right now, and I think it's very interesting. When you look at the seven churches of Asia Minor, Revelation chapter 2 and 3, did you know that on all seven churches, God says to every one of them, I know thy works. Every one of them. Can I just tell you, God knows what you do. I want to tell you something. We can put a facade on that we make people think we know or make people think that we do, 
but God knows if we do. And I want to just tell you that a person who's a hearer and not a doer is a person who has deceived themselves. I'm not going to turn to it tonight, but I, I just want to take for granted you already know the story. But you remember the story of Samuel and Saul? And God told Samuel, you go tell Saul, I want him to destroy the Amalekites. Remember, I don't know if you remember the story or not, but he said, Saul, Saul, go kill the Amalekites. And so guess what? Saul goes out. He's got the armies of Israel, and they go, and they fight against the Amalekites. And, but what does, Saul do? what does Saul do now? He was commanded, I want you to utterly destroy the, utterly, utterly destroy the Amalekites. And he comes back. He doesn't utterly destroy him. He saves the king, King Agag. He, he saves the sheep, the best of the sheep. He gets rid of all the other spoil. And Samuel shows up and says, Saul, you haven't obeyed God. Now, I want to tell you something. If you remember reading the story, Saul said, I have performed the word of the Lord. And Samuel said, if you perform the word of the Lord, what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? Did you know Saul had convinced himself that he was doing when he was not doing. Can I tell you, there are people who know all of the books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. First, they know all the categories of the Bible. Boy, the first five books is the Pentateuch, and the next 12 books is history, and, and the next five books is poetry. I want to tell you something. They know all the Bible stories. But I want to tell you, they've got all the right answers, but they've got all the wrong actions. You know what that kind of person is? They have deceived themselves to think that they are all right. They're not all right. Just remember, I don't know you, and I don't know how involved you are, but I do know this. You came to church on a Wednesday night, and most of you have been to church here on Monday night and Tuesday night. I want to tell you something. God blesses that, by the way. And th that is works. That is, that is doing with what we've heard. But can I just tell you that if you're not careful that you come and you sit and you hear, but you don't put into practice what God wants in your life, can I just tell you, you're going to live a deceived Christian life thinking you're okay when you're not okay, and the devil's going to get the advantage. Look what he says next here in your, in your Bible, in James here. Not only do we see this, <clears throat> a, a hearer and not a doer is deceived. Look what he says in verse 24. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, let me read verse 23. And for if, verse 23 says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a, what's the word? Glass. For he beholdeth himself... And goeth his way, and straightway, what's the next word? Forgetteth what manner of man he was, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a what kind of hearer? Forgetful hearer. All right, now, just remember, I think we can, I think we see what the Bible's saying here. In verse 23, when he says, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, he compares that person to a person that looks, in his, looks into his natural, the Bible says, his natural face. In a glass. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about a mirror. All right? Now, let me, let me illustrate for just a moment here. A person who is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word is, first of all, deceived. But a person who is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word is forgetful. You say, what is he talking about? Well, he's making an illustration here. He says that if a person, a man, beholds his natural face, they get to see you tonight. Amen? That's, that's what you look like, by the way. All right? Just think your wife has to look at that, amen? All right. you, you love that man? All right, she doesn't mind looking at it then, all right? It's like a man looking at his natural face in a glass. But did you notice what it said in that verse? It says, he beholdeth his face and goeth. Now, I want to tell you what's implied in that verse that, that, that the Lord's trying to teach us here. It's like a person that gets up in the morning. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you get up in the morning and look like you look right now? No. No. Hair's going all, I mean, if you got hair, hair's going every direction. Wax in the eyeballs. I mean, you just, whiskers all over the place. I mean, you, you don't, you get up and what do you do? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to look in the mirror. And when you look in the mirror, you don't get up in the morning, go to the mirror, look and say, oh, okay, and go on, and go on with life. Listen, my natural habit is when I get up in the morning, my, my wife is a late night owl and I'm an early bird. All right? I like to go to bed early. I like to get up early. My wife likes to stay up late, get up late. It's worked well for us, so I don't have a problem with it. But when I get up in the morning, I leave the house and I try to leave very quietly because I don't want to wake my wife up. You know, I'm going to go to bed before she does and she's going to get up later than I am. It equals out. But so I leave in the morning and I do all my, I told you the night, I do all my studying in a fast food joint. 
All right, this morning, where was I at? McDonald's this morning. This afternoon was Burger King. And, uh, but I do all my studying in a fast food joint. So in the morning, I leave. Your pastor met me at McDonald's this morning. I had not had time to go get ready for the day. All right, because as soon as I get up, I don't stay. I want to be awake. I leave. All right, I go out. And I study. So he met me out there. He was about to go do some other things with me. I said, now listen, I have not gotten ready for the day. Now, I want to tell you what that means when I say I have not gotten ready for the day. Whiskers. I hadn't even brushed my teeth yet. No. <laughs> so when he was ready to go do something else, I said, now listen, I need to go back and take a shower. I need to shave. I need to brush my teeth. You know why? Because I was not ready for the day. What is he trying to teach us in this principle here? He says there are people that come to church and they hear the word and they see themselves spiritually in the, in the mirror, the mirror being the word of God. That we're supposed to be not just a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. Now church, I mean, listen, if you come to church and the pastor preaches and your mind is on what you're going to do after church and you're not thinking about what the word of God's saying or what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you, you are a hearer, and it's like you got up, you looked in the mirror, and you walked away. You didn't fix your hair. You didn't brush your teeth. You didn't shave. You just, you just, you saw what it was, you left. Can I tell you how many Christians come to church? They hear the word of God. They behold themselves in the mirror of the word of God, but they don't do anything. You're right. Amen. What is the reason to have an invitation? Do you know that Baptist churches all over America are not having invitations now? Can I tell you why they don't have invitations? You can blame it on whatever you want. But I, in my heart, believe that there's a man of God that stands there and week after week after week speaks the word of God to people and they're not willing to do it. Not one person comes to the altar. Not one person's making a decision. They leave the church just like they came in. So then the preacher says, well, what's the use of having an invitation to invite people to make a decision when people are not making a decision to do anything? You know what that's called? That's called a forgetful hearer. I know that you can make a decision at your seat. I'm going to tell you something. Your church, to a degree, I'm preaching to the choir because every service, somebody's down at this altar. So I'm not scolding. I hope you understand. I'm not mad. I'm not upset. I'm just trying to tell you our Christianity has gotten to the place where we think it's a wonderful thing to come and sit, come and, sit and listen. Boy, that was, a, that was a wonderful message. We don't need wonderful messages. We need messages that come from God, that penetrate the heart, that causes people to go and do something. Right. A forgetful here. I, 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 this particular thought, I preached to our church family. Actually, not, just last, last week. And I was preaching on being a hearer and doer, and I got to this point about, you know, what's the mirror for? And in the service, I messed my hair up. I'm not going to do it tonight, but I messed my hair up. And I just want to tell you something. My hair is combed all the time. Even when I'm sleeping, I'm combing it. <laughs> uh, the one thing I will do before I leave the house in the morning, I'm going to comb my hair. I'm going to brush my teeth. But I'm gonna keep my, so when I messed my hair up, the church went quiet. And we're not doing it tonight because it'll matter to you. But to, but to our people, it's like, I said, I want to just tell you something. That's what you look like. I said, your spiritual hair is going every which way, and everybody notices that you're not right with God, and you're not doing it. And the simple fact is, is you know it because you've heard it, but you're not willing to do anything about it. Now listen, to church family, we don't answer to one another. We answer to him. We don't answer the pastor. This is not Pope Castle over here. This is Deaf Castle, not Pope Castle. Amen? We don't answer to the pastor. We don't answer to one another. We answer to God. Amen. But church, do you understand a doer of the word and hearer of the word? If you just come and hear in every service, it's just, well, that was good. Hey, can I do this? I, I, I got to hustle. Would you do me a favor? Turn over to Ezekiel 33. I want to show you this verse real quick. Ezekiel 33. My father, years and years and years ago, before he died, he preached a message on modern-day Christians, and he read this verse, and I've never, ever forgotten it. Look at Ezekiel 33. Look down to verse number 31. Now, God is speaking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. Look what God told Ezekiel. 
he said, and they, the they was being, it was the children of Israel. And they come, I circled the word come, and they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit, I circled the word sit, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear, I circled the word hear, and they hear thy words. But they will not do them. Look at the rest of the verse. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Church man, I'm just trying to tell you that the, if you're going to make sure that, you don't be, that you're not a, a deceived hearer and a forgetful hearer, the only thing you can do is go back to the book of James. Look what he says. Here's, here's the answer to that. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer. You know what's going to keep you from being a forgetful hearer? Stay in the book. Stay in church. Stay around the word of God. Amen. Pastor Castle, myself, and brother, or uh, Pastor uh, Al Allison. Mike Allison, right? Am I saying his name right? Yep. Okay, sorry. Names. Anyway, Mike Allison. We're sitting, I think it was for a lunch. And your pastor asked Brother Allison, what do you do for your daily devotional time? And to be honest with you, sometimes, you, sometimes I've, I've had preachers you talk to and ask, and sometimes they tell you, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're vague. Sometimes they're, they're. But Brother Allison said, he said, we all, he said, this presently, at this present time in my life, I read four old chapters in the Old Testament, four chapters in the New Testament. You know, when he said that, it made me think, how much Bible reading am I reading? Now, I understand. He that compares himself and he that measures himself. You measure yourself by yourself, compare yourself to others. God says, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, it's not wise. But church family, if your pastor asked you publicly, how much Bible do you read? Would you be ashamed to tell him how much you read? Do you know the only thing that's going to keep you from being just a difference between a hearer and a doer is by continually being in the word of God. Yes, sir. Looking into the perfect law of liberty and continuing yes, therein. That's the only way you're going to do it. It's just really a matter of this is what you look like. And I'm not talking about physically, spiritually. This is the Bible, the, the perfect law of liberty. And as we look into it, it tells us, okay, I shouldn't be doing that. I should be doing that. Do you wonder? Church, I've had people stop coming to our church before because of preaching on standards. Church, it's not the standard of the church you got a, the same Bible everybody else has. What does the Bible say? Amen. We don't live our life based upon what the Baptist church says. We're supposed to live our life based on what the Bible says. Right. Amen. And the more we get into the book, the more it tells us how to live our life. But if we're not careful, we don't mind hearing it, but I'm not doing it. And when you don't do it, guess what? You've deceived yourself. When you don't do it, guess what? You become a forgetful hearer. What's God trying to do in your life? You're going to forget what he's trying to do in your life because of not doing what God has already told you to do. Quickly, here's the last thing, and I'm done. Notice what he says next here in, the, in your Bible. Look at verse number 24 again. Pick up verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the Bible, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be. This man shall be what? Blessed. Hey, can I just tell you, forgetful hearers are deceived. They think they're good Christians and they're not. Forgetful here, I'm sorry, uh, hearers and not doers are deceived. Hearers and not doers are also forgetful. In other words, God will speak to their heart during a church service that you need to change this, but they don't leave and do anything with it, and then they forget the decision that they made in a church service because they're not willing to go do it. Hey, listen, can I just tell you, if the pastor preaches on soul winning, and you're sitting in a church service, and the Holy Spirit of God says, hey, you don't even have a gospel track on you. Hey, When's the last time you told anybody about how you got saved? The Holy Spirit does that. I'm not talking about the preacher. The Holy Spirit does that. If you don't decide now, before you walk out that door, I'm going to do something about it, you're going to forget. You're going to forget. Hey, church family, you remember when I told you the other night about that little boy that came up to me? Did I tell that story here? Remember I told you that little boy and put that blueberry and he pushed it into my shirt? And put, I'm talking about a big blueberry spot. Can I just tell you that when I walk around, I don't walk around like this to find out if... I wore that shirt the entire rest of the day forgetting that I had that spot on me. Until 
Somebody says, what'd you get on your shirt? Oh, I forgot that's there. Can I just tell you that in this Christian life, when the Holy Spirit brings something to light, if you don't do something about it, you're going to forget about it. Now, here's the last thing. What is a doer of the word compared to a hearer of the word? What's the difference? God says, if you do what you hear, ye shall be blessed. That word blessed means supremely blessed. It means happy. God blesses your life when you do with what you hear. So the Holy Spirit of God says, hey, listen, you need to read your Bible. So he goes home and he says, listen, tomorrow morning I'm getting up 15 minutes early because I'm going to make sure I read my Bible. The pastor preaches a message on prayer and he says, okay, I'm not praying like I should. So he asks the pastor for a church family prayer list so that when he gets done praying, he prays for every name in the church. And he says, I'm going to, oh, oh there's so many people here. So he makes a plan on how he's going to do it. He says, okay, I'm going to do A through L to this week or th this day and then I'm going to do M through Z the next. He, he makes a plan on how he's going to do it. Why? Because he wants to be a doer of the word. The pastor preaches on marriage, and he makes a decision. I think I'm going to be nice to my wife finally. He says, no, he hasn't come under conviction yet. <laughs> okay, let's find somebody else we can use as an illustration. <laughs> Do you understand? The pastor does not look at your life and say, this is what you need. Do you understand what the difference between a sermon and a message is? Yeah. Sermons is what a person writes down to preach. A message is that somebody told me something to tell you. That's what messages are. Just like preachers don't preach sermons, and I know we use that vernacular in those words of the pastor preached a good sermon today. We don't preach sermons. We truly preach messages that God has laid upon the heart of the person. And so what God does is God speaks to us so we can speak to you because God's really trying to speak to you. And if we come and only hear and not do, it's not a matter of not doing what the pulpit said or doing what the preacher said. It was the message that God gave him for us. And in reality, when we don't do the message, we're not doing what God's telling us to do. The pastor doesn't speak ex cathedral. The pastor's not God. But he's got the book called the Word of God and he's got a Holy Spirit inside of him. And he's got a calling upon his life and God speaks to him to speak to us. Why is it in our Baptist churches all of it's about is getting through the sermon? Because they're not sermons. Listen, I know there's a revival, and you come to hear two people speak. And, and God bless you for that. But so you guys are not novices. You know as well as I do that the average church member, that they come not to get in, they come to get out. How long is this going to last? I'm very conscious of time, and I shouldn't be. I'm told that often, and I, and I don't mean to be. I grew, up in a, I grew up in a Christian home, just like your pastor did. I've been in church nine months before I was born. That means my mother was pregnant, but anyway. <laughs> and we had church all the time. We had school chapel. We had Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I don't know about you guys here, but you know, when we were growing up, my dad had a six, on Sunday had a 6 o'clock church evening service and a 7 o'clock. So on Sunday, we had Sunday school, morning service, 6 o'clock hour, 7 o'clock hour. Now, let me tell you what the difference between the 6 o'clock and the 7 o'clock hour was. Nothing. It was two preaching services, two different, two different messages, but it was two preaching services. When I went from there to Lawrence, Kansas, and they only had one evening service, and I told my dad, I said, man, they don't, I thought everybody had 6 o'clock church training hours, and I thought everybody had a 7 o'clock. I thought everybody went to church twice on Sunday night. That's all, all of my life that was like that. My dad thought I'd compromised. I want to tell you something. I think one of the reasons I'm, I'm very conscious of time is growing up in a Christian home and hearing so many different messages and so many different preachers. I want to tell you something. We, when I was growing up, there were some preachers that they would preach so long, they gave new meaning to the word eternity. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be that person. I want to know what God wants, and I want to give it, and let's, and let's go. But can I just tell you, the average Christian is not a matter of, I want what God's giving, and I want to get it. It's a matter of, they want to come, and how long is this going to last? Let's get out of here. You know what that is? It's being a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word. We are, you, are, you And I think you have, but you ought to come to these kind of church services, and every church, says, God, would you please, please, would you please give pastor what I need tonight? Would you please speak to me tonight? I've grown up in a Christian home, and I can't tell you how many countless services I've sat in, and I felt like I walked out and got nothing. But I don't want that for our people, and I know your pastor doesn't want it, and you shouldn't want it. That's right, amen. That's right, amen. If God's real, and he is, amen. then I believe that every service, 
he can speak to me. Amen. And if he can, and he does, then I don't want to be just a hearer. If I'm just a hearer, I've deceived myself. If I'm just a hearer, I'm forgetful. But if I'm a doer, ye shall be blessed. I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. I don't want to miss what God has for me. You know, I'll close with this. Um, you have a very unique church, by the way, to be honest with you. Part of your uniqueness is because of the hoary head. That you have several people in here that are older. And by the way, that's not a negative to a church. It's a plus to a church. Because I want to tell you something. The older people in the church are usually the ones that pray. My opinion. The older people in the church are usually the people who finance and give to God's work. The, the older people in the church are the people of, hey, I can't go back in time, so I better, I better use the time I've got left for God. Man, I'll tell you what, church couldn't make it without the older people in the church. But I want to tell you something. Your pastor has already said, I don't know how many times just in these three days about a person, this person's going to the, going to the doctor, and this person just had a, a pacemaker put in. And, and, and I was talking to you just a little bit. You've got wires or something, you know, demonic man's up here, I guess. But, <laughs> hey, can I just tell you, how many of you go to the doctor? Raise your hand. You, you can be honest. I'm going to make fun of you. Go ahead. Raise it up, all right? You go to the doctor. I'm just joking. Put things down. When you go to the doctor, do you tell the doctor, all right, do whatever you're going to do and get this thing over with? Go ahead, check, check my blood pressure. Hurry up. All right, I know I'm overweight. All right, you said it. Leave it alone. Is that what you do? No, you go into that doctor, and he does all the tests that he's going to do, and then you're all ears. And he says, hey, listen, you've you got a heart condition. You've got high cholesterol. He's, he says, hey, listen, if you don't do something about this, you're going to die. He, he says, hey, listen, you've got cancer. Here's your options. Listen to me. You don't go to the doctor and the doctor's talking to you and you're going. Hurry it up. Come on. I don't pay you to, to, to waste my time. You know what you do? You hear. And then you do. I'm just telling you, God's a better doctor than any man. And he gave you a book full of prescriptions. And we read them. And we leave like we came in. When really, we should hear and do. Church, God wants you to be a doer. He wants you to be a doer. And we can make all the excuses in the world. But if you're breathing, you should be doing and we can't do like we used to. I'm 54, and I tease about these guys getting older, but I'm telling you what, I can't believe. I hate 54. You know, I remember the days I could run up and down a court. I run up and down the court. Today, I'm going to be on the floor. I want to tell you something. We all are aging. And we might not be able to do everything we used to do, but we can still do. Sure. Would you bow your head and close your eyes tonight? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just ask you to please help us, Lord, again, to be doers. I know there's times in every church service you speak to our hearts and we think to ourselves, well, God, help us to realize how important it is to be able to hear that still small voice. How many people go to church and never hear, never even hear what you want for their life? Lord, they're in a church that they can hear. Father, help them not to miss, and Lord, help us to be doers of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand. The piano's playing. The altar's open. Let's do something right now. Let's make a decision right now. We've got to get past this thing where going to the altar means something wrong. It means something's right. It means that there's something right in our hearts, that our God, is, we're in tune with Him, and that we have been brought to a point and to a place of decision. That we have submitted ourselves, our will, to an omnipotent God, an all-powerful God, who will not force His will. But he declares it, leaves it for us to do, and gives us his power to do it.